All right, you are welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is to this business. We'll be heading straight to our chat session. And this time around, we'll be looking at the um, recently submitted and, and um, endorsed uh, Nigeria uh, Sustainable Economic Plan by the Vice President and his team. How feasible is this sustainability plan? How easy is it going to be for Nigeria to bounce back? Now, to dissect this issue, we'll be speaking with Ikemesit F. Young, Head of Research SBM Intelligence. Good day, Kemesit. Uh, great to be on the show. Good. Awesome. Nice to have you here into this business. Thank you for joining us. Indeed. All right. We will be um, talking about the Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan. That I mean, that's the reef of the moment right now, as the Federal Executive Council has endorsed and has approved the 2.3 trillion naira um, plan. Um, I want to first of all get your thoughts on this whole, you know, on this whole plan. Um, it is said that it will help to produce or to provide jobs um, for Nigerians and they will delve so much into infrastructure and um, agriculture as well to enable people go into, you know, such sectors and we help create jobs there. I want to get your impression, first of all, on this whole, you know, on the report. If you've gone through it, you'll be able to see um, the plans that the government said it has towards Nigeria bouncing back. What's your impression, first of all? Okay. Um, first of all, thank, thanks one, once again for having me on the show. The economic sustainability plan is supposed to be a 12-month transition plan between the economic recovery and growth plan, which has been the signature economic um, philosophy and thinking of the current administration, and a successor plan to the ERGP, because the ERGP was supposed to expire um, this year. Like you rightly said, the economic sustainability plan sustainability plan is supposed to create jobs, it's supposed to pump money into the economy and hopefully stem um, what seems like an inevitable slide into a recession while supporting small businesses and also prioritizing local content in all of its key pillars. Now, the, econ the economic sustainability plan became necessary as a result of our economic experience heading into the coronavirus pandemic Nigeria had already been on a tenuous economic path pre the pandemic. Um, growth, as you said earlier in your show, was um, was very slow. It was just barely over 2% last year. The IMF thinks that we were not going to see any growth this year and we might see tenuous growth next year. The government in the economic sustainability plan itself projects a GDP, a GDP loss of um, 4.40 percent in in the negative column. Um, if there is a stimulus, and if 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 we respond um, pretty quickly to, uh, to to deal with various economic levers which are sure to suffer as a result of the pandemic, and if there's no economic stimulus plan, um, it would be almost nine percent in in negative growth. So so that's the situation we're in. Um, all prices are really low. Oil, of course, it is our primary export. Gas, which has been um, somewhat of a lifesaver in terms of showing up the government's revenue profile, is also being challenged. Um, a report came out um, yesterday showing that the LNG might make something on the order of, you know, half of what it, it brought into the government coffers um, last year. Oil, even though it's at, even if it's even though it's in the low. Um, $40 per barrel region is also being hampered by the fact that um, in in most of our major export markets, there's still a pretty substantial um, lockdown or restrictions on, on business and economic activity um, going on. So the plan, in theory, looks like it's addressing most of the key situations that we we are facing and we will be facing over the next 12 to 48 months. The problem I have with the plan is that it's mired in a lot of bureaucracy. And so, for example, there is a housing strategy in the plan in which the government is supposed to, in which the government is pledging to build 300,000 new homes for Nigerians. But that is, but the primary responsibility for that is is, is laid in the Ministry of um, Housing and, and, and Urban Planning, Works Housing and Urban Planning. And 
is, it isn't clear that the government has a strategy with respect to the kinds of homes it wants to build, where the locations are supposed to be. It's saying that it's going to build um, homes, 400 homes in each of um, Nigeria's 774 local governments. But again, the thrust as to who is going to lead. Is it going to be the federal government or is it going to be the state government? What's going to be the state buying? Where are they going to get land? All of these things are not you know, captured um, or, or under the plan. And those are some of the gaps and some of the loopholes that we, I, I think we should anticipate that we would see um, when, if the, when and if the plan gets implemented. Another problem is funding. So the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, said that um, 500 of the, of the 2.3 trillion Naira, which the plan is supposed to cover and which is supposed to spread and cut across direct cash transfers, support for small businesses, and also an infrastructure rollout. 500 billion Naira is already appropriated for us, so the government has that money already in its coffers. It's going to get 1.2 trillion Naira in structured loans from the CBN, and then the remaining 344 billion Naira, which is supposed to plug the gap, will be um, will be will be sourced through um, domestic and external borrowing. We all know, your viewers would know, and you would also know that we have been borrowing a lot to shore up our revenue lines. My organization did a report just... Um, it came as it. Um, just, yes, it came as it. Yeah. Before we go into borrowing, which I know it's a big, it's a big issue, and we have two school of thoughts on this borrowing thingy. Let's talk about the performance of the um, ERGP, right? Comparing it to, you know, the... Of sustainability plan right now that we are, we are we are we are going through now what was the performance of the ergp you know putting into consideration what we are seeing right in front of us did you do so well is there a need for this when we are we are not done with um, the ergp in the first place okay so before we talk about the performance of the ergp i should say that um, the ergp was conceived in a pre-pandemic situation and so a lot of the a, a lot of the modeling and a lot of the the targets wow. which were set under the ERGP um, did not take into account that we are going to face a once in a lifetime um, pandemic. So in that sense, some additional planning was necessary. However, the ERGP, even in the pre-coronavirus era, struggled to 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 hit the marks, the very high marks that it sells for itself. Now the ERGP was based off of the Vision 2020 plan, um, which was conceived um, first under the Yardo administration and then supersized under the Gulag Jonathan administration. And the entire point of the ERGP was to set us on a path to meet a target by this year of becoming a top 20 economy, of being an economy which has a GDP of um, 900 billion Naira, uh, um, 900 billion dollars, I, I beg your pardon, and also to have an average, to have a GDP per capita of 4,000 um, US dollars. We're very far from that. The last I checked, we're a roughly $370 billion, billion economy, right? We're still very, very much a lower middle income economy. If the inflation targets under the ERGP, in which the government's committed to getting inflation to single digits, has not panned out. Over the lifetime of this administration, inflation has been, has been, has, has been at double digits um, at, at, has been at double digit levels. And you also have a situation where, in terms of building self sufficiency in agricultural production, in certain aspects of substitutes and um, substituted manufacturing, we've also not met those targets, largely because we've had a situation where, in practice, the, the central bank has taken um, as, as run point in terms of um, executing and also defining what monetary and fiscal policy would be. And there has been a managed Naira regime, which has ensured that a lot of the local manufacturers who need, who need export inputs in, in, in order to show up their value chains and make sure that they are able to produce products across a vast swathe of industry haven't been able to do that um, because, because the government is keen on keeping the, the Naira um, at a certain value vis-a-vis -vis the US dollars. So in, in whichever way you look at it, the ERGP was an unqualified and mitigated um, failure in terms of the targets that it set, right, which um, a lot of us analysts also um, thought um, were very ambitious targets at best, in the best of times. And so, um, flowing off of the experience we've learned in terms of the implementation of the ERGP, there's really nothing that gives us cause 
for excitement about the new economic sustainability plan. All right, Kemesit, thank you so much. Just for the purpose of information, the ERGP simply means Economic Growth Recovery Plan. Thank you so much for um, that insightful analysis. Now let's go to borrowing. Um, the government um, clearly stated here that they would have measures to mobilize external support and funding, right, um, to help, you know, the economy um, not to suffer daily from um, recession that would be coming up. Now, just a few days ago, the CEO of Ecobank, Adia Deemi, said something about um, borrowing and, and asking for debt relief moratorium, that it's going to be very hurtful to whatever country or whichever country is asking for this um, debt relief. What is your thoughts about that? We need money. We don't have the money, but we need to borrow the money. And here is an expert saying, we're not going to borrow because we're not going to ask for debt relief because it's going to hurt our credibility. You go, he, according to him, he said something that forgiveness is not helpful because your debt is somebody else's savings. When you go to the market to borrow money, the market is looking at your current and past behavior. Can you please help us create a balance here? What should Nigeria do in this particular situation? Uh, well, it, it, it really depends on what side of the divide you're in. So I've read um, analyses by, um, by, 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 by foreign experts, by e economists, who have argued that the idea that um, debt forgiveness is, is inimical towards future borrowing um, is in the case. You look at the situation of countries like Argentina, for example. Um, Argentina has had a well-documented, um, as it has a well-documented um, history on, in some cases, even defaulting on its debts, um, let alone seeking for debt forgiveness or, or debt restructuring, which it has sometimes been able to secure in the past. But when you when you look at the current situation with respect to to Argentina, Argentina is still in the debt market. There are still people who are lending to Argentina, albeit at double digit interest rates, but it's still able to tap the debt market. So the situation around debt forgiveness or debt restructuring um, is laced with a very, very long litany of countries who have been able to achieve um, forgiveness or restructuring and, uh, and still have access to the debt markets. The, look at our experience, for example, during the um, Obasanjo um, administration with the Paris Club and debt forgiveness strategy. We have gone from a situation where um, under our batch, our debt to GDP ratio was something on the order of 80% at its highest um, to a drop of almost 8% under, under, during um, Obasanjo's second term and into Yaradwa's first term. Now we're creeping up, we're approaching 20% now. It's still somewhat sustainable. But if you look at the trajectory of borrowing under the life cycle of this current administration, it gives, it gives a lot of room for pause. So you've had a situation where we haven't balanced the book under, um, under this current administration since it started we've had to borrow practically to service debt. The IMF is saying, for example, this year that we are going to spend all of our revenue on debt servicing alone. So we need to borrow for capital investment. We need to borrow for, uh, we need to borrow for a current expenditure, paying salaries, paying contractors, um, and the likes. And so when you look at you know, that picture, overall debt is in the situation. How you manage your debt on a month-to-month -month, month basis is the critical issue. And in that sense, it's not clear that if we borrow more money, we'll be able to pay back, especially at the rates at which we're borrowing, we'll be able to pay back in a way that is sustainable and in a way that leaves room for the government to actually do the things that government is supposed to do, you know, build infrastructure, um, ensure that public sector workers are paid, and also provide a level playing field for the private sector to be um, important economic actors. So... So, 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 so in our situation, you could have a situation where debt forgiveness, even if you make it happen, doesn't eliminate the fact that you actually need more money, like you rightly said. So, so, so even if the um, if, even if the billions of dollars that we owe right now to international and local creditors, and actually most of our borrowing has been domestic, is written off. We will still need to go to those debt markets, and it's mostly going to be the same people who have borrowed you money in the past, who have the appetite for, for emerging market debt, who will also borrow money. So, it, so it's an interesting catch-22 situation, and I think that probably figured, um, figured into the thinking of the finance minister and, and also the CEO of Ecobank, Adi Ademi, like you rightly pointed out. 
in that um, we can remove all of these debts that we have now, but we still have debt in the future that we're going to pick up. We're most likely going to pick up those debts from the same people that we currently um, owe, that are currently our creditors. Um, so what's the point? What I would like to see is more intelligent revenue um, revenue generation. So, re so revenue generation right now in the country um, takes on the form of a glorified rent-seeking model. I would like to see a situation where the government can actually step out of the way in terms of the various levers and the various parts of the economy it's managing and actually allow people to, act, to, to generate growth um, independent of um, a lot of government action. And then you can tax you know, a lot of that growth and then you can see your revenue profile somewhat stabilize. Right? Until we get to that point, we'll still need the debt market. And if we need the debt market, we will need to be responsible in how we manage the debt we already have. Oh, thank you for that.